Understanding jewellery compliance in the EU is essentially a matter of understanding the REACH regulation. And the REACH regulation, in short, sets limitations when it comes to certain substances, various chemicals and heavy metals. So the REACH regulation, it doesn't apply specifically to jewellery. It applies to all consumer products in, in the EU, generally speaking. It also applies to all materials, meaning that it's agnostic in that sense when it comes to let's say, stainless steel jewellery, plastics, brass, coatings, and so on and so forth, right? So, in short, when you are importing manufacturing jewellery, you need to ensure that the product, well, the materials, right, doesn't contain substances above the set limits. For example, this can be lead, can be cadmium, nickel, mercury, Substances are, well, commonly found in components used to make jewelry. So I'm not wearing jewelry right now. I, I never am, in fact, but I brought this nice watch anyway. Not sure if you can see it. Right. Um, so the point is that let's say that this, I mean, essentially a watch is a piece of jewelry, but what, what reach would mean in, in practice within the context of jewelry is that I would need to ensure that this case, right, this stainless steel case, actually without coating, is lab tested. And in order to be compliant, for this watch case to be compliant, it cannot contain any of the restricted substances above the set limit. If it is, if it contains, say, lead above the set limitation, and I don't remember that limitation, it's, I don't know, 10 ppm or something then I can't sell it in the EU. So this leads to the next question. How do I, as, as a brand, right, as a jewelry brand, how do I determine the substances that I need to get my jewelry pieces tested for? My recommendation in this case is that you don't do, you don't make this assessment yourself. You don't try to map out, okay, is nickel on the list? Well, for the record it is, but to try to try to compile a list of various substances and the corresponding su substance limits my recommendation is that you leave this to a qualified testing company you reach out to say Kima Intertech Bureau Veritas and as long as you can share bill of materials as long as you can give them material information they should be able to determine okay a this is a list of substances uh, that are restricted and b that we deem to be necessary to test uh, for this specific material, right? Because there are differences. You would apply a different set of substance tests to say a zinc alloy as compared to say plastics or coating on, on say wooden beads or, or, or some, something like that. So that's, that's my recommendation. You leave this out to the testing companies to, to make this assessment. So, hundreds hundreds I was about to say thousands actually there could be substances that are on the say annex 17 list and and also on the SVHC list so it's not just we're not just talking like 10 12 substances to keep track of here so it can really be overwhelming for uh, for that reason given that the, the scope of restrictions is is very broad okay another thing I'd like to bring up in, in this video is perhaps we should perhaps I should call it supply chain risk because my background is in, in manufacturing. I used to live in mainland China for, for um, seven, eight years and I used to work quite a bit with, with jewelry um, years before starting Compliance Gate and when it comes to, when, when you're sourcing jewelry, I think the main challenge you will face, at least within, within the context of product compliance, is that the vast majority of suppliers cannot provide material test reports or any form of indication uh, as to whether their materials are compliant with, with the REACH regulation. So what this means is that you, if you are importing uh, or manufacturing jewelry, you will almost certainly need to arrange third-party lab testing yourself. You will not be able to rely on uh, test reports provided by your supplier. It's very rare in the jewelry industry that you find suppliers that can provide pre-existing and up-to-date lab test reports, uh, say with, for re the REACH regulation or any other regulation that applies to, to jewelry for that matter. 
So again, what this means is that you need to rely on third party testing in order to verify compliance before you import the, the pieces uh, to, to the European Union. And that is of course, um, can be expensive and it would be ideal that the suppliers could actually provide pre-existing test reports, but that's not really, that's not really the case. I think one reason is that there's a lack of data in the supply chain and the truth is that many suppliers, they don't actually know what their materials contain. The way the jewelry industry works is that you have a very large, let's say, industry of component suppliers, right? And then the jewelry manufacturers, if I can call them that, they are rarely, well, I would say most of them anyway, they're not molding components in house. What they do is they are buying components from a pretty wide network of component suppliers. And essentially what they do is they are assembling this in house. These companies, they generally speaking, they don't have any, any, any test reports. They don't have any substance data. I don't think they even take this into consideration, but there is a, perhaps I should call them a subset of suppliers that they tend to be more experienced working with, um, buyers in the EU and the US and so on, where substance restrictions is something they have to take into consideration. Doesn't mean that you can expect pre-existing test reports, but what it can mean is that you can inform the supplier that you absolutely have to only use reach compliant materials, okay? And given that you can have a long list of components that go into say a bracelet, right? You got beads and you have metal parts and logo tags and, and, and so on and some sort of thread, right? That they only procure materials that they are confident are in, in, in this case, in the context of the EU reach compliant, but they absolutely have to be informed about this before you place an order. And not just that, you have to inform the supplier that the product will be subject to lab testing. If they don't have this, let's say incentive, if you don't tie, let's say the test to the balance payment or something like that, and you inform them in advance that, listen, if you don't arrange, if you don't ensure that the components you buy, the materials you use are reach compliant, then you're not gonna get the money. So that's really the strategy that we have been applying with our customers when it comes to these jewelry transactions simply because there's too little data in, in the supply chain. We can't rely on uh, pre-existing uh, lab test reports because in most cases they simply don't exist. So you have to transfer, let's say, some of this liability, right, to your supplier because end of the day, they are the only ones that can actually navigate, say, the supply chain. And I wouldn't say this is only the case for mainland China, but that's, you know, mainland China is still the primary, uh, source for for jewelry but anywhere in asia i think i think you're really facing this this dilemma which yeah really comes down to lack of lack of transparency and and incentives i would say all right in any case there's more to jewelry compliance in the eu than just reach but you can find more information about that on our website we have a fairly comprehensive guide that covers jewelry uh, product regulations and standards in the eu there's also hallmarking there's various testing standards and so on labeling requirements to take into consideration if you have questions about this topic you can uh, write a comment either on our website scroll down to the bottom of the page we can do the same thing on youtube and of course subscribe if you want more of these videos